So the next thing I want to talk about is um, what sorts of questions I'm looking at with this topic. All right, and I think of it with students in a, like a 204. My my 204 students have not yet heard this, but they will when they propose a topic and they have to write a prospectus. One of the things that I ask them is the sort of so what question. All right, so that. Uh, if you're going to pick a topic, and it may be a topic that you love, you have to think about what it means in the, in the broader picture. Why would someone be interested in that? And what issues does it relate to? So I want to sort of talk a little bit about which issues that in looking at these two particular icons I'm going to, um, that I, I've sort of explored in research and that I'm going to write about. The first issue which in some ways is maybe the most obvious, has to do with uh, the history of nationalism in France and how that relates to the army and anti-militarism. Right? And I've been thinking about this over the last couple of weeks with some of the conversations having to do with Egypt and what's going on with those revolutions and the question of where the army sits. And are they a good force? Are they a bad force? Um, I saw it again with Libya today, you know, wh what will the military do? In the French case, the military has a very complicated uh, past. If you go back to the French Revolution of the late 18th century, the, you get the left celebrating the military, right? Because the military helps protect the revolution, and then going into Napoleon, you have uh, a lot of victories and you have a lot of glory attached to uh, the, the French state. Generally, it starts out with a lot of positive images, whether that is um, statues, whether it is books, some kind of celebration of the military. All right, And I want to sort of just show you some images of that and show you uh, the sort of trajectory across the 19th century into the 20th. When you look at Napoleon, he sits at the beginning of the 19th century and he's very sensitive to the earlier Ancien Regime and parts of the Bourbon legacy, which was the monarchy in France. So I wanted to start with, this is Louis XIV, the best known Bourbon monarch. And he is leading troops on a horse. All right? Here you have Napoleon. Right? And this is a famous painting. And I know some of you will know immediately that it is, you know, a rep he actually was on a mule. But uh, this is what he chose. He actually um, talked about what he wanted to project in uh, the image. Right? So he picks up on some of the Bourbon legacy and he carries it into the 20th century. The use of the horse, the use of the uniform, a lot of energy uh, as the leader. All right. Now as you go across the 19th century, you see this carried through in the legacy after Napoleon leaves. Right? So here he is. Um, in what is it called an image d'épinal, right? These were popular prints that were done very, very uh, cheap to purchase, right? They did them so that uh, the common people, maybe even peasants, could afford them. Uh, if, if you know anything about the Ancien Regime, you can sort of see the resemblance to a royal entry, right, with the king on a horse. This is Napoleon III, right, Napoleon's nephew, comes in the middle of the 19th century, and you see a lot of images like this where he picks up on, he's working off of his uncle to gain popular support. And you see this, so you have the image there, and a lot of times you see a printing where it tells the story, the, the valiant story of Napoleon III, or sometimes you see it with a song text about either Napoleon or Napoleon III. One thing to notice as we go is how the forms change, right? So under Napoleon I, you see, you know, for example, these big formal paintings. Here you see cheap uh, broad sheets, right, which were done, but very, they look, um, you know, not very sophisticated. As you move through the 19th century into the 20th century, things become more sophisticated. So here you see the introduction of color, right, uh, into an image. This is General Boulanger, Georges Boulanger, 
And in the 1880s, he became a very popular figure as Minister of War. And again, you can see the use of, you know, he's on his horse up there, looking very Napoleonic with his hat. Um, and, and images of in battle leading troops, right? All that vigor that, that um, you can see with the earlier images. Uh, he threatened a coup, right? There was a, a, a great moment at the end of the 1880s when everyone wasn't sure if he would follow in the footsteps of Napoleon I, Napoleon III, and carry through a military coup and take over the government and topple the republic. So in the French case, there's a, there's a real nervousness about where is the military? Is it on the side of the republic? Uh, does it want to go back to some kind of a monarchy? Can it be trusted? Now, the republic itself uh, is not above or below using militarism to promote itself. And this comes from 1880 when they've instituted the national holiday of the Bastille Day, right? 14 juillet. And here what you see is a celebration of the common soldier. And you have a sort of setup with this is the revolutionary soldier and then this is the soldier uh, from the late 19th century. Brothers in arms, uh, you see the whole tricolor, right? It's very um, nationalistic. And the, you can see the République Française, the RF standing for the Republic, all right? So they're not seeding ground. They're not just giving up all positive militarist images to the right or to the monarchists. They're trying to pull it back and make it part of the Republic since it was there at the beginning with the French Revolution. Now going forward into the 20th century, because my project is going all the way up past World War II, uh, I looked at uh, representations of generals during World War I and then after. This is a, a pretty well-known painting of the um, Victory Parade from July 14th, 1919. This is one of the big moments. And this is Joffre, who was uh, the leading general at the beginning of World War I. And this is Pétain. This is Pétain, right? And Pétain uh, was very important, Philippe Pétain, in the last part of the war, and in particular in the Battle of Verdun in 1916 when he was viewed as the savior of helping the French survive the war. Now, some of you may know this better than others, Philippe Pétain does not disappear, right? He doesn't just sort of march down the Champs-Élysées and retire. He comes back as part of the French government in World War II that collaborates with the Nazis, okay? So, um, you have the military here, it, it, led by Pétain, um, as part of this collaborating government. All right? And you can see here with his you know, uniform, right, clearly identified. Now in the French case, the other thing that you see in this period, beginning especially in the 1880s and carrying into the 20th century, is a reaction against the military. All right? So the left, the political left, uh, develops an anti-militarist streak in the 1880s, 1890s. And some of this is related to socialism and to its internationalism. It's related to the idea that if they go to war, it will be the middle class asking workers to go and die um, and to, uh, in the process, shoot other workers from other places. All right, so this is again from the police archives, right? One of the things that I would come across were these big announcements for meetings. All right, so you have to imagine, this is actually a pretty large poster, right, like that. And uh, it is for, as you see, 1904, calling for an anti-militarist meeting, okay? Now in the same period, you see a lot of images where generals do not look good, all right? You don't see very much specific with Napoleon, right? Uh, you know, ridiculing him. Although I'm, I, I am very interested in the sort of limits that they could go to either making fun of Napoleon or Joan of Arc um, or not. In this case, what you see is they're, they're very upset with military justice. They don't like the use of the army in labor strikes, right? That the, the, it's being used by the government to break up labor strikes. And so you have this sort of, the idea of the, of the military leaders standing by, right, while the soldiers use violence on other French, 
All right. Now, another thing I found in the archives from the same period was this is a, a note, right? And it says, uh, it, it's addressed to soldiers because France had conscription, so everybody was serving in the military when they were young. And it asks soldiers not to fire on your brothers, okay? And one of the things about archives, and especially the police, is that this came attached to a nice note. Now, you don't always get this. You don't always know where something comes from precisely, and this actually says precisely where the police officer found it, but when you do find it, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So this is from a, a police officer in Paris, 1906, and he explains uh, the exact place in Paris where this was, the sign was tacked up. And this gives the police some sense of where um, the subversive activity might be. They can keep soldiers away from there. They don't want the soldiers uh, contaminated by this sort of politics. All right, so that is, that's one theme. I know it's, I have three more uh, that I'm going to think about as I put this together, all right? Now, the second theme that I have been studying is the issue of religion in all of this mix. The French, again, beginning especially in the late 19th century, uh, had a, a serious debate over the place of religion in public and also within the state. And in 1905, they decided to separate church and state officially. And in the years before and the years after, uh, there was a lot of debate over this. And in this case, Joan becomes a central figure to this. And it has made me think a lot about the difference between Napoleon and Joan uh, relative to religion, and also whether this is gendered, which I'll talk a little bit more about. 